Hello everyone and welcome to a new edition of Tracing Text with Anton and Sylvia and a very uh, smiley Sylvia today I must say and I think uh, it might be because we're going to be talking about an author that she really really enjoys. That's right it's our 10th episode and we also have a special guest today as well and that's Dr. David Carithers. Hello glad to be here. We're happy to have you and um, uh, we know that uh, Borges is a writer that you particularly like as well and so uh, we're going to be delving into some of these um, best-known uh, stories that come from this uh, really renowned book that he wrote in the 1940s uh, called Ficciones, or Fictions in English, and so it's uh, always wonderful to get together uh, here around the table and talk about good literature here on Tracing Texts. And we're going to start uh, the show today, this episode number 10, as Sylvia said, with a story that Sylvia has chosen, and that story is... Uh, we're going to start with Circular Ruins. But uh, before we do that, um, I think we should talk a little bit in general about his biography and some of the thematic elements so that we give our listeners a bit of a framework. So um, just to begin, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, um, and we're looking at his uh, book, Hall Ficciones, as you mentioned, Anton, it is in uh, English. It's been translated from the Spanish, so it is available to everyone who would like to read. Uh, he, he's an Argentinian writer, and he, but he was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina, in 1899. Uh, he died in Geneva, Switzerland, in 1986. Um, what's really interesting about his uh, career in, you know, as a writer is that he actually learned how to speak English before Spanish, and um, he read many books from his father's library. He had a very extensive collection, including The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, The Thousand and One Nights, and Don Quixote. And I remember that, you know, now that you mentioned Don Quixote, he once said, he was no, uh, well known for saying that he enjoyed reading Don Quixote better in the English translation than he did in the original Spanish. Yeah, I had no idea about that, so that's a good tidbit of information there. Yeah, and I, I think one interesting thing that, that happened to Borges when, when he was younger is he, uh, he suffered some kind of head injury around 1938. Not sure exactly what it was, but it led to blood poisoning, and he was near death. He almost lost his speech, um, and he feared for his sanity. And when he came out of that, it seemed to be some kind of breakthrough period for, the, for him because he had previously not delved into fiction much. He had written mostly journalism and essays, and he threw himself uh, wholeheartedly into the fiction, and it seemed to kind of break down some creative uh, barriers for him. And it was in the next eight years that he wrote his most fantastic stories, including those in, in this book, Ficciones. And he was also quite the world traveler. Right, he was, and he, uh, his family did live in, for a time in Geneva during World War I. Uh, then in 1919 they moved to Spain, but ultimately they end up returning to Buenos Aires in 1921. So he, he was very worldly uh, in terms of his travels and where he lived, but also, of course, he was very well read, which also, you know, allowed him to be so creative. So um, I guess then we can move on to some of the thematic elements um, as well. So um, some of the thematic elements in general that I think are prevalent in ficciones um, are the reason for existence. He always has that, uh, or uh, often in some of in these stories. He looks at symbolic constructs. In other words, like why we have symbols, why those symbols represent what they do. Um, the image of labyrinths is prevalent as well, mm -hmm. uh, doubles, uh, the myth of the eternal return, time in the sense that time is circular rather than linear, mm -hmm. and just truth versus fiction, the, the you know collection itself is called Ficciones, and that is to uh, question the very notion of truth and fiction. And in that sense, he's very Cervantine, and you mm -hmm. know, obviously, his reading of Don Quixote and, and the works of Cervantes made a big impression on him, and this is one of the uh, reasons why so many of his uh, works deal with that uh, theme of 
truth versus fiction, you know, the idea of time, uh, as, as you were mentioning. So this is going to be clear, I think, uh, as we start delving into the uh, stories that you've chosen today. That's right. So should I go on sure. <laughs> with our actual story? Um, so we'll start with the circular ruins. Um, it's a, a short story that I particularly enjoyed reading and then uh, looking at more closely. And um, the Circular Ruins basically is about a wizard or a magician that dreams up a man. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that process, he discovers that, in fact, he is a product of somebody else's dream. So um, through this text, I think that the notion of life as a dream becomes, you know, the underlying theme there. And that idea, however, is nothing new in literature. We see that, that in recurring uh, works. Um, creativity is also a major theme because the wizard uh, wants to create this particular man. Um, and maybe we should read a little passage here. Um. Yes, uh, in fact, uh, I think um, one of the things about um, this, this story that, that, that I find interesting is uh, that idea of, of, of dreaming um, something that then becomes a part of reality. Uh, which in many ways, and we'll be able to, to talk about this in, in just a bit once we talk about the next uh, story, has a lot to do with what happens in uh, Tlon Ukbar Orbis Tertius as well. Uh, so, Sylvia, do you have the... Uh... Yeah, so um, he talks about uh, how he wanted to dream a man. He wanted to dream him in minute entirety and impose him on reality. This magic project had exhausted the entire expanse of his mind. If someone had asked him his name or to relate some event of his former life, he would not would not have been able to give an answer. So he real his goal, this the protagonist of the story, is to create through his dreaming, which sounds very fantastical. Um, this man and he is able to do that through the dreaming and in fact he somehow creates a whole group of students pupils which is fascinating but it's the one who questions him that becomes kind of goes on to materialize or, or become embodied in some way um, so I find that uh, very interesting and in also in the sense that it, I, it epitomizes human creative aspirations. I think it kind of speaks to that as well. Yeah, it's uh, again, you know, the idea of the, uh, the father and the creator at the same time, you know, um, and I think that that is one of the uh, obsessions, I think, throughout the work of uh, Borges and a lot of his stories in, in particular. Um, I, I think it's it's quite interesting the way that he ends this story by mm -hmm. talking about the uh, obsession that a father would have with the sons that uh, he creates or that he permits to exist. Right. And this is a little bit what 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 the story is about as well. Right. But I'm not sure if you if you agree with me about this, uh, and we may be able to talk more about that after we've uh, talked about the stories. I have always found uh, Borges's literature to be uh, extremely playful. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. not, as, not, not, not to say that it's art for art's sake, but it's getting, it's getting close to that, in that he is playing with the reader all the time, not just with the reader's expectations, but with, with, um, uh, with the reader as a reader. You, know, right. you can never yes. be sure that what he's saying uh, can, be, can be trusted in many ways, exactly. because he has like, another turn of the screw <laughs> right. to, to paraphrase the, the work of one of his favorite authors, Henry James, right? Yeah. The, all of his narrators are unreliable, we could say. You know, the old trope of the unreliable narrator. Uh, they end up not being who, they, who you think they were throughout the whole story, then it's revealed they're actually a different character uh, uh, in the story. I think the death and the compass was the like same that, thing, yes, it? exactly. So it's very playful, uh, a lot of puzzles to work out. It's fun. 
sometimes students will say, well, I mean, what's the point? Why are we, I don't understand, you know, I tell them, you know, some people play chess, some people play video games, the literary types write like Borges and, and read these fascinating stories. At least uh, the ones that write the way Borges does, because he, he definitely is, is a writer that, that, that likes to play with the idea right. of literature. It's, exactly. It's, it was the, the point that I wanted to make, that right. one should not approach Borges in a serious manner. Right, Because no. he talks exactly. about things that are serious, but he does it in a very playful, right. uh, sort of even mischievous way, right. <laughs> right. if you will. Yes. You're listening to a new episode of Tracing Text with Sylvia and Anton. I think I stepped on you again, right? There. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, of course, we have uh, yeah, David, our friend and colleague, David. And we appreciate you being here talking about uh, Borges. What else, Sylvia, do you have uh, that you find interesting about this story? Why did you choose this story among the many different stories that uh, we can find in this uh, right. really famous book by Borges? Well, in addition to the creative aspect that I mentioned, I think he also, uh, I would say the more serious part of the story is the, the whole idea of questioning, you know, the various cosmogenies that are possible or why we exist or what, why it is our this universe and maybe not a parallel universe because everything comes into question as to our very own existence. We're not quite sure at the end. Just like the protagonist, mm -hmm. we think he's a wizard, but in fact he's just, uh, at the end, a, a dream, and an illusion. And so then it makes us question our own mm -hmm. origin, our own existence. And that kind of links this to uh, works like uh, La Vida es Sueño, right. Right? Life is a Dream by Calderón de la Barca. Exactly. Or even that really famous American poem by Edgar Allan Poe, Is It All That We See or Seen But a Dream mm -hmm. Within a Dream, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So, so I, I find that part uh, really fascinating to, to question that because it is kind of... Uh, you know, a game in a sense, but at the end, you're left with that those thoughts like, well, perhaps <laughs> I am part of that story as well. I am part of that dream, and one day I'm, I may realize I don't even exist. So um, I think that, the, for me, that's what really appealed to me in that particular story. There's also a little uh, play here with the uh, idea or the basis or the fundamentals of religion, don't you think? Oh, definitely, because when he arrives uh, ne the, by the temple where he, you know, his goal is to sleep as much as possible, <laughs> so <laughs> sleepy, I wish we could do that, to do sleep it. away and yeah. create everything, write our papers, <laughs> do our presentation, right. but um, he mentions that um, the, you know, the gods that are there, he's not even quite sure mm -hmm. if it's, uh, you know, what kind it is. He's, it's not very precise. So, um, There's also he some says, woodsmen around there that kind of, uh, some, some, yeah, some woodsmen, some, some uh, uh, leñadores, right? In, in Spanish, no. I think they talk, they talk about something like that, how they actually um, uh, leave him some food oh, yeah, and, yeah, that's and some bread and, and, and that sort of thing, thinking that he is actually a divine being. Right. Mm -hmm. And he says this circle was a temple which had been devoured by ancient fires, profaned by a miasmal jungle, and whose god no lo longer received the homage of men. Mm -hmm. um, so this, there's a god that has been, you know, passed, you know, they're no longer worshipping this particular god. And there's also the... Um, it's, he's not sure if it's a stone tiger or a horse, so it's not very clear as mm -hmm. to what was worshipped in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in that sense, he's definitely questioning, you know, the existence of God and who is God. So, or at least exploring, exploring the, the, um, the, the, the possibilities. Origins, possible origins of religion, because one of the things about Borges was that he always puts us in a world that's very much outside of our own world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, exactly. In this case, it looks like we're traveling way far back in the past mm -hmm. in this yeah. story. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I think that when I first read this a long time ago, although, you know, the it gives me a sense that it's like some he's either in the Amazon jungle or perhaps an Aztec temple, like that's what I imagine the the setting to be. Because I imagine like these exotic, uh, you know, temples and you know, idols. 
and then some, you know, very sacred priest comes in and, and does his magic, and this is how then the story transpires. But then that was in my head when I first read this many years ago, the first time around. Well, uh, this story, I think, is really well chosen to start our episode because, uh, you know, as we uh, move into the next one, unless you uh, have anything else, Sylvia, that you I would like I to add, um, we can see, I think, connections between uh, Las Ruinas Circulares, or the Circular Ruins, and uh, the next story, the one that you, David, have, uh, you've chosen, uh, which is uh, Tlon Ukbar Orbis Tertius. Now, what about that story? Uh, attracted you. I know you teach it, I know you, you like it, you've read it many times. Now what what is it about this story that you enjoy and that maybe um, you would like to share with our listeners out there? Well, uh, I'm fascinated by the story because in it you see almost all of these big uh, themes that Borges plays with. You see him uh, uh, questioning our notion of time, of authorship and originality, um, of you know, of fiction and creating a world through fiction, uh, just notions about metaphysics and even particle physics. So the the big physics and the the tiny um, nano physics. Um, it's an interesting piece in which um, th there are these imaginary places, these geographical places that are completely created through these fake encyclopedias. Mm -hmm. So the, the first line of the story is, I owe the discovery of Ukbar to the conjunction of a mirror and an encyclopedia. So uh, there, there are always mirrors in, in uh, Borges' work, that idea of doubling and mirroring, um, and, and the, the idea of the mirror as kind of a magical uh, looking glass. And, and the world is a kind of playful mirror like that. Um, so in the story, you have a kind of a benign underground group that for some reason wants to create these fake uh, geographic regions. And uh, most of the story focuses on Tlon, which is actually a, a, an entire imaginary planet. And there's a funny part where the, the group that wants to create this through these various encyclopedias, uh, they go to uh, an American millionaire, a millionaire who is... Uh, living in Memphis, I think, mm -hmm. and they, they tell him their plan. At that point, they just want to create uh, a fake country. And he's American. He's dreaming bigger. He kind of laughs at him and says, this is America. We're, we're not just going to create a country. We're going to create a whole planet. <laughs> so that, that is funny for me to read that. And it you know plays on that idea of, of everything being bigger and sometimes overly developed in, in America. Um, so they do that, and they they basically get all these, they go through all this trouble to, to uh, publish tons of encyclopedias that, you know, they, on the surface they look like regular encyclopedias, and, and they're all, all supporting uh, a study of this planet, and they, they show um, the metaphysics of the planet, the flora and fauna, all the, the biodiversity of the planet, and it's all made up. But it gives Borges a chance to, to play around with some of these themes. Um, for example, the, the metaphysical theme, um, the metaphysicians on this made-up planet, they consider metaphysics a kind of fantastic literature. Mm -hmm. So instead of sort of trying to figure out questions about God and things like that, they, they want to be amazed by the universe. So mm -hmm. the, the quote is... Um, the metaphysicians of Talon are not looking for truth, it, rather they're looking for a kind of amazement. They consider metaphysics a branch of fantastic literature. So, you know, Borges is always playing with our ideas of religion and um, the supernatural, and at least on that planet, they're satisfied by being amazed and not, not really, you know, finding all the answers or the one true answer. We might say those metaphysicians on that planet, they might not be too far off. Yes, because the problems with metaphysics is you know you 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 basically creating a, a whole science uh, that has no known object. Yes, right. and right. so you know I think he he can see that, and I think mm -hmm. his 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 view of religion is very um, I wouldn't say problematic, but he tries to problematize 
the right. idea of religion he certainly constantly does. throughout his work. Yes, right. he certainly does. I would definitely say that. And I would say that that particular statement, I think that's what he wants us to gain from that, to, to be amazed by metaphysics instead of maybe necessarily obsessing over a truth. But just simply, uh, like, you know, you talked about uh, just the, the word awesome in the true sense, like you're awed mm-hmm. by the universe rather yes. than having, than finding mm-hmm. who created this universe, just accepting that awe, being amazed. Yeah, the, the, the most over, yeah. overused of words in the English language right. these days, oh, but yeah. in but the true sense of the word, in the true sense of the, the word, you're imagined. truly yes. awed by <laughs> that. Well, one thing that I find interesting uh, when you when you read that very first line um, is is the fact that uh, I think in this in this story um, Borges is is really uh, creating a reversal of reality in that usually we have encyclopedias to to kind of uh, record what's already there instead of using them to create something that doesn't really exist. Yes. But at the same time, you know, does something really exist until we record it? Uh, yeah. That yeah. that's again the philosophical approach that that we might be thinking about here, and of course right. I, I don't know if that's what he was thinking, but that's what it makes me think when I when I read this story, which I find one of the most fascinating. Right. I think that that he has uh, that that he ever wrote. Yes, right. me too. I agree with that completely. Um, and I think by creating this fake planet, it it, it allows him to to question uh, the the realities here on Earth because he has the their metaphysicians over there, really. Uh, uh, supporting some some strange beliefs. One of their notions about time is very interesting, and we talked about time as something Bohr is uh, is really fascinated with. Um, so they're, you know, it's so complicated. There are actually different schools of thought on this planet about time, and one of the schools denies the the whole existence of time. And here's a quote from the story: This school of thought reasons that the present is undefined that the future has no other reality than as present hope, and that the past is no more than present memory. Yeah. And so, you know, I think he's always questioning mm-hmm. our notions of past, present, and future, that idea of, of linear time. Um, you know, he, I think at least in this story, he's looking at time as something that's, I won't even say circular, it's mm-hmm. just kind of all there, all present at once. Right. It's fluid. Yeah, uh, simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And also the idea of whether time exists or not independently of human beings. Yes. Like in a place where there are no human beings well, living. Well, time still. Does time really exist or not? Yeah. That's again uh, a, a a kind of uh, question that kind of points again towards the playfulness of his of his mm-hmm. uh, literature because he's not really looking to uh, give an answer about this or, right. or 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 at least not a definite or definitive answer. But yes. just raise this these sometimes very playful, very in, seemingly meaningless um, right. um, ideas that actually are very meaningful if you if you start you know thinking about them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So and you know you mentioned that humans their their kind of uh, their interjection in, into the natural world. I mean you know does time exist if humans aren't there to record right. it? And uh, he plays around with that idea in the story too, especially with. Uh, particle physics really right. mm-hmm. and this you know the, the fascinating notion that, that has been shown in some of the studies that show that the particles act differently you know when humans are actually looking at them and trying to record them <laughs> Which is- and uh, it, it, it's odd and it's kind of uh, frighteningly fascinating to, to see what these little particles are up to because so we like to think of our world as very solid and you know uh, very predictable but when you those tiny particles can be very un- unpredictable. So in, in, on the planet of Tuan, um, the inhabitants can kind of uh, create a, a physical object uh, through through hope, through thinking about it, and it actually creates a thing, and, and it has a name. It's the Ur, I guess, U-R. Mm-hmm. It's a, a thing produced by suggestion, an object brought into being by hope. And I think that's interesting to, to think about. You know, the humans, our, our uh, viewing of the natural world, our mm-hmm. experimentation with it, it actually, you know, changes its uh, mm-hmm. activity and its movement. That's pretty fascinating. Well, hope turns out to be operative in that, in that um, 
planet or in that world, right. whereas in real life, uh, you know, in our world, you know, hope is something that might give us comfort, but that will not necessarily be operative right. in a, a specific um, occurrence of the real right. world. So um, maybe more like hope as in willing something to happen, uh, so mm -hmm. that the hope is a little bit more, uh, not just a w wish, but you're mm -hmm. actually make like I think that the, he plays also with this magical elements of being mm -hmm. able to conjure something up through this hope just like you know mm -hmm. with the circular ruin so I kind of see it as a little bit more active than mm -hmm. just a simple hope not like, contemplative not contemplative that, exactly yes. it's like they are able to create this fur <laughs> these little earth things yeah. that exist objects. And that's how we can uh, actually uh, link this story with the previous one. Right. In that uh, the creation here is the creation of things, whereas in the other story, uh, Las Ruinas Circulares, or well, Circular Ruins, would be, uh, it would be actually a human being. Exactly. And I, I think that in that sense, like um, he also plays with the idea that literature in itself is what create like you said it's not just written by but literature creates our planet mm -hmm. uh, us as individuals our sense of identity so i think in a sense he's mm -hmm. creating that as well yes and the kind of spooky thing in, in the end uh the way he ends this is that the this imaginary world of talon it actually comes true uh the, the last paragraph begins then English, French, and mere Spanish will disappear from this planet. The world will be Tlon. Mm -hmm. And so in this story, they've, they've fictionalized this planet, but in the end, you know, it is uh, going to be a reality. So it's, it's just this idea of kind of projecting a world through fiction mm -hmm. and, um, and it actually having it come true. And if you think about what humans do, we do dream up things mm -hmm. that become reality, and you can see... Uh, just, I mean, things like, uh, uh, you know, not Nazism or something like mm -hmm. that. Right. It, that was kind of created through these ideas, and then it was brought into fruition. Right. And exactly. also the, the idea that I think we've, we've mentioned on the show before, the idea of fiction as being part of reality. Right. Not something totally alien to reality, uh, but actually a part of reality. Because if it were not a part of reality, you wouldn't be able to be holding that book in your hand right now. Exactly. So you actually mm -hmm. wrote it, and by writing it, this fiction is not totally different from reality, it is no. a part of it. Exactly. It's just that, of course, none of these characters can come out of the book and actually be operative in, in real life. Well, mm -hmm. perhaps. Hopefully not. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> You're listening to a new episode of... Tracing Text. With... Sylvia. And Anton, and today also with... David. And we're happy to have you here. We're coming to you from deep in the heart of the state of Tennessee. I don't think I said that before, did <laughs> no, I? No, you didn't. You, you forgot that line, but that's okay. <laughs> now, all the works by uh, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, uh, this great Argentinian writer of the 20th century, uh, they always have something to do with the idea of authorship. Mm -hmm. You know, he is obsessed with this idea of authorship, most likely because he was an author, right? right. Um, is this true also of um, these two stories that we have um, looked at so far, uh, Tlon, Okpar, Orbis, Tertius, and the Circular Ruins? Yes, de definitely with uh, Tlon, Okpar, and Orbis, Tertius. Um, there's this idea that there's either just one book and one single author. Uh, in fact, that's a quote from uh, page 28. Mm -hmm. uh, the dominant notion is that everything is the work of one single author. Books are rarely signed. The concept of plagiarism does not exist. Which it didn't way back. Yeah. That's true. So, so all authors are one author. Right. And, you know, he says in many of his stories, you know, Shakespeare is all men. You know, and even Jesus and Judas are all men. So mm -hmm. I, I think he's playing around with the idea of the archetype. You know, if, if these stories have meaning, then, you know, they truly represent um, all humans in some way. So he, he's definitely, uh, in his made-up world of Tlon, mm -hmm. there's only one author. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and that's very interesting. 
Yeah, well, if you think about Borges and I, you know, Borges y yo, that's basically right. what that story is about. So that's that's what kind of got me thinking about the idea of authorship and how it would appear in these stories. What about the right. circular ruins? I, I don't know if it's as direct, you mm -hmm. know, with writing, because here he's creating a human being. But I think in a sense, uh, it is very much uh, with respect to authorship. I think about, like, uh, uh, the Mad Woman in the Attic, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, book by Kubar and... Got the other name, but you know the whole notion of authorship and creating with writing, creating something, materializing something. So in that sense, I would say definitely uh, it deals with authorship. And in addition, I would say that his stories also focus on critics mm -hmm. of literature as mm -hmm. well, often mm -hmm. looking at or poking fun at those of us <laughs> who <laughs> like to look at literature and give it some sort of interpretation as mm -hmm. well. Well, so. also the, the, the idea that literature is really not literature without a readership. Right. Mm -hmm. Because if you write something and you don't publish it or, you know, right. it doesn't get to an intended or unintended audience, then um, how could we consider that to be literature? Right. Uh, I mean, right. the communication process does not happen, does not exist, kind of stops it <laughs> midway, yes. right? So. Yes, and in, in fact, in this story, it, it says criticism is prone to invent authors. Mm -hmm. So the the critics are there to oh, yeah. support the authors, but they in, in this imaginary world they even invent them. Right. And I think in real life, uh, uh, you know, they may project themselves upon the author or upon the work, right. yeah. and see things maybe that may not even be there. Right, the author right. didn't intend. Or even if he didn't intend, uh, it, it may be there or not, but, but in many cases, you know, you, you read some, some um, texts or some articles and you think, well, wh wh what was this guy thinking when he wrote this? I mean, right. this critic, what was he thinking? That's not in right. the text. Right. You know, many times we have articles that we read where the text doesn't even appear at all. Right. And it's basically a bunch of... Um, uh, theory, yeah, you know, that does not have the text in, in, yeah. in, 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 I mean, that doesn't bring it in, 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 into, into context or, you know, so I think it's, uh, it's a very interesting point that he's making there. Right. Mm -hmm. And as readers, um, these points of reference that are mentioned in the story, they're shifting because we are moving through time. What we understand from this is going to be understood in a different way by the a next generation. It may mean something kind, a slightly different, so it's constantly shifting as well, in that sense. Exactly. Um, one thing this story, th both of these stories share is that idea of, of doubling, or mm -hmm. of uh, the dreamer and the dreamed, mm -hmm. and perhaps this reality is just a dream that someone else is dreaming. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, on this imaginary planet of Tlum, there's a theory that when we are asleep here, we're awake somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So every man is two men. Mm -hmm. um, pretty fascinating, and uh, but very Borean-like. And, <laughs> and, and in the circular ruins, you have the same thing. The, in the same end. idea, right. because he's two men. He's in one, he's the wizard, in mm -hmm. another, he's simply a dream, or perhaps, you know. Yeah, a dream, perhaps that's all he is in, in the other world. And is bringing uh, into, you know, the 20th century this this idea of, of the double that al already appears in the tradition before Dostoevsky or uh, right. even Shakespeare's uh, plays and some of the plays of the Spanish Comedia of the 16th, right. 17th century. Um, you know, the idea of the double uh, is, is very important. And so that's really right. one of the obsessions in, right. in Borges, like a constant one, too. Right. And I think he also looks at how sometimes, I guess we don't want to accept that perhaps we're not as important, we're not the wizard, and, you know, the protagonist of the story. And I, I like how at the end, the wizard, with relief, but with humiliation, with mm -hmm. terror, he understood that he was also an illusion. So all of those feelings together, some way accepting and, and who knew that Borges would include both Nashville and Memphis, Tennessee in, in I this know. story? And how they would both figure, and they're, they're pretty important because the American millionaire is the one who, who funds this whole thing. Mm -hmm. He had a fascination with the United States, I think, because there are a lot of stories in which he mentions American millionaires or American cities and, you know, right. American right. universities as well. Right. Yes. So, so, definitely. Last word on Plon, David. 
Well, I, I would certainly recommend it. it. It has all those big themes that Bohr has is, is so famous for, and, and it's a fascinating look. And um, it's also fun and playful and funny in places. So, as you said, you know, we, we need to approach Borges with a, a, a kind of in a playful manner hmm. and uh, and not take it too seriously. I feel like if I take it too seriously, I find myself getting angry at, at, at Borges sometimes. <laughs> you know, right. How can you say this? But it's really just playing with you, and you have to bear that in mind yes. <laughs> as you read the text. Yes. So. Another text that I think is uh, extremely interesting uh, because it, it, again, talks about this obsession with libraries and books and labyrinths and texts and all that. Um, he really was very good at tracing texts. Right, <laughs> right he, that's uh, what he did. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's actually, um, and, and actually he was a, a, a librarian, yes. which he didn't like, uh, apparently. So. It was yeah. not something he enjoyed, but it made an impression on him uh, and was an obsession throughout the rest of his life. I'm talking about the uh, a text that uh, in Spanish is uh, titled La Biblioteca de Babel, and in English it's uh, the Library of Babel. So we're going right. back to Sylvia now, who has uh, chosen this uh, text, which, by the way, is prefaced by um, a little uh, quote from The Anatomy of Melancholy, uh, by this art, you may contemplate the variation of the 23 letters. And really, um, this has a lot to do with the story that, that, that he wrote, the, the Library of Babel. Because the Library of Babel is all about language, it's all about books, mm -hmm. it's all about text, uh, and even about characters. But right. not characters as in people, but characters, the actual as characters that you the, write. The, the letters, letters themselves, the symbols. In, in a, that's right, in a, in a, in a uh, book. So, Sylvia, the Library of Babel. Well, I think it's interesting that you mentioned this particular quote because at the very beginning when I was preparing for the class that I lectured on this, I was curious as to you know what the reference was, the anatomy of melancholy. I wasn't familiar with that. But it's a work by uh, Robert Burton. Mm -hmm. It was published in 1621. It was and a decent period, yeah. Yeah, and it was actually kind of... Uh, a text, kind of a medical text about, you know, people suffering from melancholy. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, it's a, a, a precursor of maybe our, uh, you know, what we consider depression or mm -hmm. whatever. And I think that was very interesting that it starts with that. Um, and maybe our, I don't know, maybe the melancholy of mm -hmm. life or our, some sort of insecurities that we may feel. So I thought that was very interesting as well. But as you mentioned, uh, in this particular story, the universe itself is a library. And um, I'll read the very f introduction because I think this tells you, you know, kind of visually what this universe is like. It says, the universe, which others call the library, is composed of an indefinite, perhaps an infinite number of hexagonal galleries with enormous ventilation shafts in the middle encircled by very low railings. From any hexagon, the upper or lower stories are visible interminably. And he goes on with descriptions of, you know, there's 20 shelves to one direction and then the other, and it, it goes on and on forever. And there's a mirror in this gallery, which some say because there is a mirror, then it must not be in infinite because mm -hmm. that's just creating the il illusion mm -hmm. of infinity mm -hmm. but others say well it's there kind of again as a joke to make you think mm -hmm. that it isn't infinite when in fact it is mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's that um, there's a spiral staircase and I think that uh, we talked about linear time, mm -hmm. circular time, but then in some ways it can be spiraling, so you come kind of back to some point, mm -hmm. but it's not exactly the same. Um, I think it might allude to that as well. Um, so that's the, the library itself, and within that library, all of these texts that exist that you know, in some way explain the universe. Mm -hmm. And there is one particular book that is being searched for um, and cannot be found. So he talks on page uh, 80 of, of the version that I have. He says, the idealists argue that the hexagonal halls are a necessary 
form of absolute space or at least an intuition of space. There are different like sects that try to interpret the mm-hmm. library. Mm-hmm. So in a way, again, playing with our notions of um, understanding God or and, and so therefore different religions mm-hmm. that exist within this universe. Um, and he also again talks about the symbols themselves and how some of the texts that mm-hmm. repeat themselves mm-hmm. may differ only by one character. So they're mm-hmm. exactly the same, <laughs> mm-hmm. but for one little thing that changes. And yeah. so... I think, you know, when, when you think about this idea of the uh, never-ending library, whether it's infinite or not, how, how can you even think of the idea of an infinite library? It, it's like thinking about a circumference that, that has a radius that's never-ending. That's impossible. Mm-hmm. Right. That doesn't really... That, that, that kind of, again, he's playing uh, around with the, with the rules of math and physics and, and, and everything. It's something that's, that in real life, it's, it's not possible. But he's trying to, 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 to work uh, this into the story, uh, knowing all the while that he's being playful uh, with the reader that reads this in a serious way. You know, um, so for example, uh, there there are some uh, also. I don't know if, if in those uh, if in your editions uh, there are um, footnotes that are actually from Borges himself. Oh yes, yes. Um, <laughs> there's one of them. I think it's number three that says uh, in my version, which might not be exactly the same translation. He says, "I repeat, in order for a book to exist, it is sufficient that it be possible, mm-hmm. and possible is uh, italicized there." Only the impossible is excluded. For example, no book is also a staircase, though there are no doubt books that discuss and deny and prove that possibility, and others whose structure corresponds to that of a staircase. All right. So uh, <laughs> that itself is, again, that, that other turn of the screw every time. You know, he says something and he says, but uh, other people think, you know, uh, something else. But this idea that in order for a book to exist, it is sufficient that it be possible, that's clearly in my opinion, you know, reading this, it's clearly um, Borges laughing at his readers right. out loud, mm-hmm. you know, because how can you say that? How can mm-hmm. you write that and then yeah, yeah. sit down and, and drink a whiskey? <laughs> and, and I, I don't understand that. I think that's the only thing left after you read that. Um, well, I think he's also playing around with just the almost infinite possibility of... of uh, what you can do with language mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. the you know the endless varieties of sentences we could make up and the fact that you know we go through life each day and every day you're going to say a sentence that's brand new mm-hmm. that no one has ever mm-hmm. uttered or it, it may be in, in some of Borges's universes someone mm-hmm. else is uttering that exact same sentence but just and like these books it may the only difference might be a comma or one little character space or yeah, yeah or even a space mm-hmm. Uh, but it is pretty fascinating to think that we can live a lifetime and, and continue to create new ideas and new sentence structures and new whole new uh, stories and books, even though some may say there's nothing new under the sun and every story has already been told. Somehow folks are still churning out new fiction every day, and it's, it's new enough for most people. Right. And I think it's interesting what you mentioned because he also talks about uh, how if they were to like burn or destroy any of these works, it wouldn't matter because there's always that other there are you know, facsimiles. Yeah, there are facsimiles right? with only one little difference, which then you know makes us question. You know, when there have been cases of censorship or actual book mm-hmm. burnings, you know, did you know was that knowledge truly destroyed. In some ways, mm-hmm. it still exists And in out many there. cases, it wasn't. It because wasn't. Because they have actually survived. And survived, or, mm-hmm. you know, it's in some way, it's still out there, and it's not at the same time. Yeah. Well, you know, you can destroy the physical representations of ideas and right. things, but those ideas, I think, are, you know, continue on. Uh, think of the Romans. Every time mm-hmm. a new emperor came along, they would destroy all the statues from the previous mm-hmm. emperor. Mm-hmm. They just tried to wipe them out of history. A lot of times they would even get rid of all the manuscripts and books that were written about that emperor. 
and yet we still have the full history in many, many books of, of all these uh, emperors. And that's a that's a very current idea here in the United States. It's, it's, it's been in the yes. news a lot lately when you talk about monuments and things like right. that. Right. We, we won't go into that, but it's clearly something that we're still thinking about in 2017. Right. Yes. Um, but also, you know, the idea that after the crea the invention of the printing press, suppressing the books is a lot more difficult because there are many more copies. Right. And right. there's always the possibility that one copy will survive. Right. Or yes. two, you know. And, 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 and it has happened many times that, that books that had been banned by the church or banned by the Inquisition or something like that, they actually survive. We still have them. Right. And that's because, you know, because of this mechanical reproduction of the... Uh, of the printing press, which uh, allowed for right. a lot more copies of the books to And exist. in a sense, with the internet, mm -hmm. the the Library of Babel is kind of, in a way, like the internet, with all these infinite connections going on and on forever. So, in a way that it expands or kind of multiplies mm -hmm. the possibility of reproducing all of these texts. You're listening to a new episode of Tracing Text with Anton and Sylvia. And today we have David. Well, we're happy to be here chatting about Borges. Uh, and one thing that um, I think is interesting about this story that maybe you can you can speak to is the fact that at some point in the story it is mentioned that uh, if all the books in the world are contained in this library, then all the problems in the world could be solved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, how idealistic could that be? Uh, because you know uh, this this kind of sp this kind of speaks to the idea that it is possible to solve every problem by means of language. Right. But maybe that's not necessarily true. I think in the story it's it's technically possible because they're all it's all there somewhere, but mm -hmm. it's impossible because all these searchers and all these sects they can never find it. Right. And you know there is. There's one sect that believes there is one book that's the cipher and is going to translate and make everything else clear. It's going to be pretty much analogous to a god, uh, but they can never find it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's it's interesting to think that it's it's possible, but um, not not really doable mm -hmm. because it's it's too infinite. You, you're, you, these people spend lives and generations of right. lives trying to find that secret, and they never find it. And in fact, the, I think the narrator says something about having squandered all his life right. or all his searching. years searching and <laughs> yes. never finding right. what he was looking for, right? And in some ways, like in this search mm -hmm. for this, you know, in the Crimson Hexagon that he talks about mm -hmm. where, you know, they will find the books that, you know, have this, you know, they can solve the riddle or mm -hmm. the life or whatever. I, I mean, I think that maybe it's because, in a way, everyone's reading a different text in this infinite library. Mm -hmm. It's slightly different, these uh, facsimiles. We are all, in a way, speaking different languages, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or approaching this whatever problem in slightly different ways, and therefore it's impossible for us to all converge mm -hmm. on one text. Which is the idea of Babel, right? The confusion right. of different languages. Yes. yes. So that's kind of why I think he also, you know, titled this story, you know, the Library of Babel. But in that sense, we're all speaking a different language mm -hmm. to some extent. And there's yeah. also the religious idea, right? Because it's talking about this this uh, what's it called, the book man, right? Yeah, the, like the, man the man of the book, book. the yes, man of the, the book, man okay. Of the book. Yes. Um, and and they talk about the fact that you know that person might have existed and might have. Uh, read this book that explains all the other books, uh, and so all of a sudden, uh, very quickly, there are a lot of people who worship, not the idea, not the book, but this actual person. Right, the man. <laughs> that the they're book. not sure if he exists or not, or she, and but he or she has uh, actually read this book, but they're not sure that this has been true, or you know. And <laughs> There's so, a lot right. of doubt here. <laughs> That's right. It would be, you know, uh, I, I, I would say, you know, uh, with maybe a, a Spanish joke. There's a lot of subjunctive here. Right. 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 There's, right. A, there's I, I a lot of doubt. That. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of people think Borges is nihilistic. That you know, all this playfulness ends in uh, this view of the world is just meaningless. But it, at least in, in this story, the narrator has hope that we will find some truth, and you mm -hmm. see towards the end, you know, he's looking for the total book, and he says, I pray uh, that unknown gods, that, that some man, even if only one man, 
even though it may have been thousands of years ago, may have examined and read the, the one true book. Uh, so, of course, he's always playing around with our notions of, of what the narrator mm-hmm. means and what he's saying, but mm-hmm. um, uh, there, there's a, a little monkey wrench thrown into the idea of it all being meaningless and, and just mm-hmm. useless fun and play. He says also, let heaven exist, though my own place be in hell. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and then he goes on to say, let me be tortured and battered and annihilated, but let there be one instant, one creature wherein thy enormous library may find its justification. Sounds to me like he's trying yes. to find right. a justification for his life's work, even right. if yeah. it doesn't really yield the fruits that right. he was expecting or hoping that it would. Right, right. and I think that's why he ends... Uh, at the very the very last sentence, my solitude rejoices in this elegant hope. So mm-hmm. there is hope that one day that book that contains the cipher to understand mm-hmm. all of the books will in fact be found. And in that sense I think it's hopeful, even though there is there are playful elements. Yeah, I think he get gets out of that by saying the library is unlimited for periodic. <laughs> so <laughs> We're hoping. that is why it is it's unlimited because I mean it can be unlimited and periodic at the same time. Exactly. Right? So, uh, so I think that bringing that that oxymoron, you know, together, he kind of uh, again he's playing with this idea. Uh, that's why every time that I that I imagine Borges writing these stories, I, I imagine him just laughing. And, and kind of smiling in a mischievous way as he writes these stories because he's thinking, oh, the, 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 the readers are going to take this seriously, but I myself am not taking it seriously, <laughs> no. right? Exactly. exactly. So. And, you know, he's, he's not afraid to stop and address the reader directly mm-hmm. in this story. Um, you know, he's playing around with the different meanings of, of language. He says, you know, in one universe, library is actually bread or pyramid. Oh. And finally, he says, you who read me, are you sure you understand my language? Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's what I thought. Which in fact, as you read reading. that, you're actually using a different language than the language that he wrote it in originally, which would be Spanish right. while we're right. reading it in English. So yes, <laughs> that brings exactly. an extra layer of, of, of complexity. Right. right. So yeah, the notion of translation and it, you know, always changes the meaning slightly. It's never the, exactly the same again, and, and, and yet it's 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 more interesting to him to read Don Quixote in English than in Spanish, right? So, yes. Going yeah. back to what we said yes. at the beginning, which is maybe that is a more truthful rendition for him. Well, as we wind down the uh, episode of tracing texts, uh, I would like to um, ask the two of you um, to to tell the audience out there, um, if not how you first encountered. Um, the figure of Borges, uh, at least what his literature, reading these uh, stories, uh, sharing these stories with students, uh, has has meant to you. What what has that brought to your perspective on literature at large? I know it sounds like a very complicated <laughs> question, but I'm sure you could you you could do it in just a, in just a few sentences. Sure, I'll go first. Um, <laughs> I I first encountered Borges like most folks as an undergrad in college, but I didn't really dig deeper into him until graduate school, right? I had a great class on postmodernism. So, uh, I, to me, he's, he's kind of the father of, of postmodernism, of this playful language mm-hmm. of, you know, of questioning the, uh, the, the reality of fiction and showing us the fictionality of fiction, as mm-hmm. I like to say, and kind of pointing out that, that these are fictional, uh, these are fun experiments he's playing with and mm-hmm. he plays around with you know criticism and authorship um, so it, it's taught me to to approach text in, in a, a light-hearted manner and not get too serious with them and, and since it's helped me read James Joyce and mm-hmm. Thomas Pynchon and mm-hmm. people that uh, certainly Pynchon I would say is read his Borges oh, and yeah. so it's it kind of opened up the what can be kind of uh, challenging literature in the, the postmodern literature mm-hmm. and, and to realize that it doesn't have to make sense uh, you know it doesn't have to have a linear A, a, a to Z mm-hmm. uh, progress but you can still have fun with it and just enjoy it for what it is which is entertainment that makes you think you know so I would recommend it and he's certainly one of my favorite authors mm-hmm. I think Sylvia shares that yes definitely. My first encounter with Borges was before I even read him. 
when I was a little girl, around five or six, mm-hmm. that's when uh, they started having that Spanish. That was not that long ago, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it was only like about 15 years ago. Oh, or right. So. Okay. We <laughs> no, uh, they, when Spanish language television was introduced into the U.S., I think they didn't have their programming quite set up. So between soap <laughs> operas, they would have these little mini documentaries. Mm-hmm. And I very specifically remember two. One was about Borges. And one was about the origin of chess. <laughs> wow, t- t- talk about high culture and low culture all jumbled yes, up, right? And and soap <laughs> opera and then Borges and yes, chess and, and I, quantum physics. Or... Exactly. So I do remember, and they would repeat these. like So that's why I remember it, because it was very repetitive. They had a few, and mm-hmm. they would repeat between you know, programs. But something about, like, they would do a mini biography mm-hmm. and some of, like, the thematic elements stuck with me Mm -hmm. and I so I knew that I was kind of intrigued by some of the ideas I know it sounds kind of crazy but I thought well why do I exist or whatever but I didn't read him at all until I was an undergraduate Mm -hmm. and that's when I actually read some of these stories for Mm -hmm. the first time and loved them so that's how I (laughs) well that's interesting (laughs) that was my first introduction as for me I remember that in in, in my dad's huge library you know when when I was a kid and my dad always had thousands and thousands of books at home uh, he had this uh, edition of the complete works of Jorge Luis Borges and uh, it had uh, a picture of him a really old Mm -hmm. picture Uh, not not, I mean he, he was old in the picture and I was always fascinated by the looks of Borges, even mm-hmm. before <laughs> I even read uh, his his uh, stories. We I read maybe a couple of them in high school, and mm-hmm. then of course, graduate school, uh, I got to know him and his work uh, better. But since you mentioned that thing about the uh, Spanish language TV, um, one thing that if you all out there speak Spanish, one thing you should definitely check out is if you go to YouTube and you type in uh, Borges a fondo. Mm-hmm. Uh, there used to be in the 1970s a really good uh, interview program on Spanish TV called A Fondo, In Depth. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is an absolutely fascinating interview in black and white with uh, Borges on there. So if you get a chance to read that, uh, to watch that, I think you would, you would enjoy it if, if you speak uh, Spanish. I'm not sure that there's any... Uh, subtitled versions of, right. of, of it on YouTube or not, but it really is well worth it. I wonder if those are excerpts that was an excerpt from that, because it could it have could been. Be. I remember very specifically, I knew that he had gone blind, mm-hmm. and like yeah, you said, the image had, also, yes. his image was very like intriguing, mm-hmm. so that that definitely <laughs> stayed with me. Now, Sylvia, tell us a little bit about that uh, edition right there, so the people out there uh, may be able to uh, maybe purchase it and, and read it. It's in English. Edition of right. the book. So it's Ficciones by Jorge Luis Borges. It's by Grove Press. Mm-hmm. And this particular uh, edition was has a copyright of 1962. So um, I think it's very it's accessible. On You can purchase it online. It's very easy to find. And even though the title is in Spanish, it says Ficciones. I think it's so. actually in English. They didn't right. want to translate. They didn't translate, <laughs> which I like that. Mm-hmm. I think that the, because, I mean, fictions, yes, that's a translation. Mm-hmm. I think it, it sounds nicer still in Ficciones. It's still understandable. It's still too, understandable, you know, yes. yes. And this edition has a very good introduction by Anthony Kerrigan. Right. Which uh, it, it's uh, very well done and doesn't go to too much mm-hmm. in depth with his bio, but just it, it's kind of bore and even in the the intro. It right. puts the maybe the stories in context a little right. bit. Right. Yes, a little bit. So I definitely recommend this edition, and I think any of our listeners would enjoy if they have not read Borges, discovering Borges and reading some of his stories. All right. Well, we uh, uh, reached the ending of this uh, episode of Tracing Texts, and as always, uh, there are ways of getting in contact with us, right? That's right. So if you have any questions or comments, you can reach us by email at tracingtexts at gmail.com. That's T-R-A-C-I-N-G-T-E-X-T-S at gmail.com. You'd have no problems with the spelling bee right there. No. <laughs> well, there's a story with that too, but anyway. <laughs> Some other time. We can get into that. Yes. <laughs> and then uh, we would appreciate comments or suggestions also uh, via iTunes. You can download our podcast and, and subscribe. So whenever there's a new podcast, it will automatically, you know, 
download into your iPhone. <laughs> and besides iTunes, it will also be available on YouTube as a video, right. and you can just play it and uh, uh, listen to it there. You won't be able to see us, but you'll at least hear our voices. That's uh, right. That's another way. And for the next uh, episode, uh, I think it's going to be my turn. It's, right. Uh, Time for, for me to start working on something. Uh, so I think um, the next time around I'm going to bring um, uh, an author. No, I'm not, not going to bring him, obviously, <laughs> well. but I'm going to be talking, we're going to be talking about an author from the northwest of Spain uh, who wrote both in Galician and in Spanish, one of the most important authors in uh, the, 19, uh, in the um, uh, 20th century in uh, Spain, and his name is Rafael Dieste. And he uh, wrote a collection of short stories which are rather fantastic, uh, supernatural, uh, dealing with the folk traditions of the northwest of Spain. And uh, in English it's called uh, From the Goblins' Archives. Oh, that sounds great. And in great. Spanish it's um, uh, called uh, De los Archivos del Trasno. So that's what we're going to be talking about the next time. Rafael cool. Dieste. Thank you, David. Thank you so much for being here. We really enjoyed having you. Thank you for inviting me. I've really enjoyed it. And thank you to our listeners. This is our 10th episode, so we're happy that we've done this. This has been uh, an episode of Tracing Texts with... Sylvia. And Anton from deep in the heart of the state of Tennessee. Thank you very much to everybody out there signing off now.